are up to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 in our verse-by-verse study through the book of 1 Peter. Today is our third week uh, in this passage, and it won't be the third and final week in this passage either. We will be revisiting this text once again the week after next. We have Chris Baines coming next week. He'll be preaching to us, um, followed by a shared lunch. More about that later. But um, after that, we will be picking back up where we've left off here today, looking at this uh, very critical text that we have before us. Um, leading up to this point, we know what the central thought is on the mind of the Apostle Peter. We know that the central thought on Peter's mind has to do with the subject of submission or the believer's responsibility to submit to the authorities whom God has placed over them. He has explained how submission is to look within the relationship or in relation to the government. He has explained how submission should look in relation to the workplace. Whereas here in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, what Peter does for us is that he explains for us and unpacks for us here applying the Christian principle of submission to the marriage relationship between a husband and a wife. Now, as I've been saying over a number of uh, different weeks now, if you are not married now, don't just tune out. Don't think to yourself, hey, this is just for the married folk. You know, think about it this way. You need to think about it in this way. If you, have, if you are not yet married and you have a desire to be married, And if God is to meet that desire with a a spouse in the future, then you want to kind of get this stuff right now. You want to understand what biblical marriage looks like, and you want to do it here, and you want to do it now. Many, many couples, myself included, didn't have the luxury of knowing ahead of time what Scripture says concerning role distinctions between a husband and a wife. But instead, you launch into marriage Finding that there's some bumps along the way and you think to yourself, oh dear, what do I do? You look to scripture and you say, oh, of course, we're not doing it right. And so if you're not yet married, if you have a desire to be married, I do encourage you not to tune out. And that includes the children that are among us. That includes the young adults among us. That includes some of you older adults among us. If you have a desire for marriage, do not tune out, but think to yourself, This is the way that it needs to be if, God willing, God brings along the right person for me. So I will be thinking clearly and biblically not only what to look for in a future spouse, but also how I need to respond when I do enter into marriage. And so all this to say... Those who are married and married couples, yes, absolutely, this is applicable for you. For those who are, uh, you know, have, have lost a spouse who doesn't look as though you are going to, you know, it doesn't, unless God intervenes in some way, you may not get married at a future, at a future point. Well, you still have a responsibility to encourage the younger couples um, in, in the church as well. And so this is just as applicable for you. Hopefully we can see that when we go through God's word, we have to understand it. It's always applicable for the whole body of Christ. We don't segregate off one another by, by age, by status, and, and, and say, oh, this is only applicable for you. No, 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 no. When these scriptures were being read, when these New Testament letters were being circulated around the churches, they did exactly what we're doing here. You have the, the older, you have the younger, you have nursing infants. You bring them all together, and these were read corporately, which tells us that each and every one of these things are applicable for each of us. And so we never, ever want to come to God's Word and tune out thinking, well, that doesn't really apply to me. Instead, you need to think, well, how does this apply to me? Because it certainly does. If it didn't apply to us congregationally, then God wouldn't have put it in his word to be read and to be taught congregationally. And so all that to say, let's keep tuned in for our third week now. And as we keep on reminding ourselves here, is that what the Bible teaches in regard to role distinctions between a husband and a wife, it's very, very clear. It's very straightforward. It's not like we're needing to do all this, you know, uh, uh, sort of um, uh, hermeneutical, you know, um, fancy work to try to figure out, you know, how can I apply the principles of interpretation to work out what's being said here? Maybe there's some nuance in the, in the Greek that we're not kind of getting. It's so difficult for us. No. What it says here in the scriptures is very, very clear when it comes to the role distinctions between a husband and a wife. Yet, yet, in our culture today in which we live... God's beautiful design for marriage has been distorted. It has been undermined by the unbiblical ideas of the feminist movement. And so for us, it's for that reason, we are needing to do a fair bit of groundwork. 
We need him to really plough the ground, as it were, to try to better understand what biblical submission looks like in a marriage in the first place. Because we have a whole tsunami of false teaching that is coming and trying to invade marriage and invade the family and invade the church saying, no, this is what it looks like, but it's running contrary to Scripture and so we need to do the groundwork. We need to understand what Scripture actually has to say in regard to this subject matter. But in terms of an outline uh, over this series of studies, again, I'm still not prepared to kind of put a number on it quite yet, but over this series of studies, there are are five main things that we are seeking to better understand when it comes to a wife's role to, 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 to respond in submission to the leadership of her husband. There are five things that we're looking at. There's number one, the principle of submission. Secondly, the extent of submission. Thirdly, the practicalities of submission. Fourthly, the power of submission. And finally, the supplements of submission. This is kind of a a broad kind of picture as to what it is that we're trying to better understand. Now, in our first study, we looked at the principle of submission. And we will remember that the main point of this study, the main aim of that study was to establish from Scripture that the principle of a wife's submission to her husband in marriage was part of God's design for marriage right from the very beginning. That's what we wanted to establish. That was the primary thought that we wanted to establish. Right from the very beginning, God's design for marriage, and in particular, a wife's submission to her, her husband's leadership or headship or authority, whatever you want to call it, that has been part of God's design right from the very beginning. And that men and women created equally in the image of God, yet without making one inferior to the other, God has purposed very clearly from Scripture that there are going to be differences in roles and responsibilities between husbands and wives. And that although a husband's headship in marriage is not the result of the curse, it's not the result of sin, we talked about the fact that, yes, there have been some distortions. There's been some undermining attitudes and behavior which has really um, devastated the family as a result of the curse. However... We identify that as Christians, as believers in Christ, we are given the power to reverse the curse, demonstrating in our marriages how equality and submission can coexist side by side. And so having a look, first of all, at the principle of submission, we looked last week at the extent of submission. Now, of course, the important thing to identify there was really that there are always going to be limitations There are always going to be limitations when it comes to submitting to the human authorities whom God places within our lives. And the reason that there are always going to be limitations is because human authorities always have the potential. I'm not always saying that they always will, but at least they always have the potential to exercise their leadership, to exercise their authority in a way that is not right. There's always the potential that's there to exercise their authority in a sinful kind of way. And so we identified last week that, biblically speaking, the only person that God requires for us to demonstrate um, complete and unwavering submission to is actually to God himself. And so it's for this reason the main aim or the main task of last week's message really was to try to identify six things that a wife's submission to her husband does not mean. So we're looking at what it doesn't mean, first of all. We, we saw that a wife's submission to her husband, it doesn't mean that she is to submit to other men. It doesn't mean that a wife is inferior. It doesn't mean that wives must submit to abuse. It doesn't mean that wives are to uh, submit to sin. It doesn't mean that husbands do not sometimes defer to their wives And it doesn't certainly mean that that husbands do not listen to their wives. And so these are just some things to run through of what a a wife's submission in marriage does not mean. Well, that kind of brings us right up to today. And moving on from what a wife's submission in marriage does not mean, in today's message, today's sermon, we're looking at what a wife's role or responsibility or duty to submit to her husband does mean. And so we're moving now today from the extent of submission to now the practicalities of submission. In today's study, under this main kind of heading of the practicalities of submission, well, 
We're going to be looking at five different aspects of this, okay? Hopefully we're kind of tracking, hopefully we're kind of breaking it down here as we go. So we're under the big banner today, single focus is the practicalities of submission, a wife's submission in marriage. But under that main heading, under that main banner, there are five aspects of it that we're wanting to cover today. Firstly, we want to to look at the definition of submission. Secondly, the need of so when the need for submission. Thirdly, the practice of submission. Fourthly, the test of submission. And finally, the attitude of submission. This is all under the bigger banner of the practicalities of submission. Definition, need, practice, test, attitude. So let's begin first of all by looking at the definition of submission. When the Bible talks about a wife submitting to her husband, what exactly is the Bible actually saying? Well, there is a particular Greek word that is used in the New Testament when it commands for wives to submit to their own husbands. By the way, it happens to be the exact same Greek word that's used in every single passage within the New Testament that refers to the wife's responsibility to submit to her own husband. In the New King James Version, it is translated as the word submit. It is the Greek word hypatasso. It means submit. Now, the Greek word is actually a military term. It's a military term that literally means this. It means to arrange troops in a military fashion under the command of a leader. When it was the word was used, you know, in that day, that is what it meant, to arrange troops in a military fashion under the command of a leader. This is God's word. This is scripture speaking as to what the word actually means. It was a military term that essentially meant being under a rank, like in the army. If you're a soldier in the army, in the military, who has an, an officer over you, that's kind of the idea of the word submit that is used within scripture. You are required to submit to that officer because you are under their rank. Now, it doesn't have anything to do whether or not the person is smarter than you. That has nothing to do with the fact of whether or not the person is more talented than you. But it has to do with the fact that there is a person who has been designated or put in a place of authority over you. When the Bible says to submit to God, what does it mean? By the way, the same word is used when submitting to God as it is used for wives submit to your husbands. If you ever want to do a little study on the word submit in your Bibles. But anyway, when the Bible says submit to God, it means that what? It means that we recognize God's authority over us. And we act accordingly. That's what it means. When the Bible says to submit to our governing authorities, what does it mean? It means that we recognize the authority that's there and we act accordingly. When the police officer sounds the sirens behind us and we look in our rear vision mirror and he's going like this, pull over, what do we do? We pull over. We acknowledge in the authority and we act accordingly. When the Bible says submit to your employer, again... My employer is an authority. I'm going to act accordingly. I'm going to follow through with the instruction and the direction that my employer gives to me. I am going to submit to them. And it's the same idea when it comes to a wife's relationship with her husband. For a wife to submit to her husband means that she recognizes that God has given to her husband a position of authority, a position of headship, a position of leadership within Then marriage, she recognizes that, she acknowledges that, and she acts accordingly. This is the idea that is encompassed in the word submit that we see in the Bible in relation to marriage. And so, what does this this mean for the Christian wife? What does this mean to you? You see this military term, you see, you know, being under a rank, you see acknowledging, you know, some authority in a relationship. What does this mean for the Christian wife? Well, it gives wives reassurance and it gives wives certainty about God's design for their marriage. It gives a wife certainty of the God-given authority uh, for her husband to bear that mantle of leadership within their marriage. In other words, it's not just some chauvinistic idea. 
is not some ultra-conservative tradition of the church, but instead a wife can have certainty and reassurance, this is God's idea. I understand this is what God has designed for my marriage. And the same idea is what Paul means in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, where he says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. You see, for a wife to submit to her husband's authority to lead, she is ultimately submitting to God. She's ultimately recognizing that this is God's design for her marriage. And so this is the place for us to start. The place for us to start is this definition of submission. Look, what does the Bible say? What does the word mean when it says, wives, submit to your own husbands? But having looked at the definition of submission, we need to move on next to the need for submission. Let's put it in the form of a question. Why is it important for there to be a designated authority and uh, and leadership within the marriage in the first place? Well, why is there the need for there to be role distinctions? Why is there a need for someone to make that final call? Well, we can put it this way. Without order, there is always going to be chaos. And without authority, productivity is always going to be hindered. Without authority being recognised in a classroom, what happens? It becomes chaotic, doesn't it? And the students are hindered from learning. Without authority being recognised in the workplace, what happens? Employees are not doing what it is that they should. Without authority being recognised within the church, there is a lot of division because everyone is trying to pull everything in the direction that they want things to go. Without proper leadership within a committee type of setting, what happens? There's going to be a lot of talk, but not a whole lot gets done. Without authority being recognised within a government, progress is hindered. You see, it doesn't matter what realm of life that we're talking about, in order for progress to happen, there must be someone that is designated to make the final call. There has to be someone who bears the mantle of responsibility to make decisions. And when they go good, then yes, they, 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 they get praised for that. And when it doesn't get so good, the responsibility, they know who to go to. And so it is within marriage. When a wife refuses to the, the, the leadership of her husband, what happens? When a wife just refuses to be led by her husband, what happens? Well, there is disharmony, there is friction, and there is resentment. When a wife refuses to submit to the leadership of her husband, progress is hindered. Things within their family become stagnant. The, the, the family can't move forward because... There is not an agreement as to who it is that is going to make the final call about things. Jesus puts it this way in Matthew chapter 12, verse 25. He says, Every kingdom that is divided against itself shall not stand. It is heartbreaking to see when a married couple are not following God's design for their marriage, and in particular when a wife is not submitting to the leadership of her husband. A lot of times the wife seems convinced in her own thinking that, hey, I'm justified. If you knew how much of a bozo I had to live with, you would know why. And so a lot of times the wife is self-justified of refusing the leadership of her husband, refusing to come under her husband's authority, when in fact she doesn't see a lot of times the devastating effect that it has, not only for her husband, not only for her family, not only for her, but for everyone around them. Yet what a blessing it is to see when a couple are choosing to follow the order which God has given for them in marriage. What a blessing it is to see. A a, a couple who are, again, not perfectly, but a couple who are acknowledging and recognising God's structure for marriage. You look at their marriage and you see what their union is producing, and you're going to see that it's producing something productive. You're going to see in that couple that there is a sense of, of mission in their lives. And to be honest... That couple will just be a whole lot happier. They'll always be a whole lot happier. You know, some people want to refuse leadership. People want to refuse authority. But the people under them are never happy. Chaos and disorder and a lack of productivity is never a happy happy scene. But when a couple are following God's blueprint, when they're following God's design, you're going to see that sense of mission, that sense of productivity. Together they're actually making progress and they're just a whole lot happier. And that's not because the couple agrees on everything. But what they do agree on 
is that God knows what's best for their marriage and they are willing to follow the role distinctions that God has given to them. Well, hopefully we've seen the need for submission. Well, moving on from the need, we come next to the practice of submission. We've seen the the definition, we've seen the need, now the practice. And so what we want to think about now is what submission actually looks like practically within a marriage. As mentioned last week, within a healthy marriage, a wife should always feel as though there is a place to fully express herself, to fully express her thoughts, to fully express her ideas, to fully express her opinions, leading up to any final decision that a husband is to make for them and and their family. It's important for a husband to recognise that the decisions that he makes they're going to have a real impact on the life of his wife. And so part of that decision-making process, it's always important to make sure that the husband is making room to hear his wife, knowing that the decisions that he makes, they're going to affect her. And given that a husband's wife has been gifted to him as a helper, well, a husband would be, I hope it's not too harsh of a word, it's a biblical word, he would be a fool not to listen to the one whom God has placed within his life for that very purpose, to be his helper. And so, what does this look like? There are going to be times when a husband will initiate a discussion. A discussion with his wife to table with her something it is that he's thinking about. Maybe that's extending hospitality to someone. Maybe that's making a purchase using the family's finances. Maybe that's a destination as to where it is that they want to go on holiday together that summer. Maybe it has to do with some ideas of generating some extra income. Maybe it has to do with buying a pet. I mean, I don't know. There's any number of things. You know, you, you fill in the blanks. The husband comes to his wife and, you know, he has an idea. He has a thought. There is something that, that, he, that he wants to proceed with. And having thought about it, the husband should then communicate the idea to his wife. Husbands, wives are not mind readers. Sometimes they sort of act as though they are, but they're not. You have to communicate what it is that you're thinking. And at this point, I think it's very important that a husband doesn't feel as though he's going to his wife to ask for permission. Okay? It's really important that, that a husband doesn't have that. And it, it's very important that a wife doesn't make her husband feel as though when he has to table an idea with her that he's coming to ask for permission. Because as the leader of the family, the husband is not requesting permission. But instead, a husband, as the leader of the family, he's requesting feedback. He's requesting counsel from his second in command, the helper whom God has gifted him with. And he's doing so as part of his due diligence, you might want to say, as part of the decision-making process. Now, as for the husband, it's important, husbands, it's important that you really hear what it is that your wife has to say. You table the idea, and it's important that you hear what she has to say and, and to really take that into serious consideration. It's not just a case of saying, honey, here's my idea, what do you think of it? by way of just kind of like ticking off the box with the intention of just going ahead and doing whatever you want to do regardless of what it is that she has to say. That's not what we're kind of talking about here. This is not something that's going to help a a healthy or generate a a healthy kind of marriage. Now, obviously, if your wife is supportive of the matter that you've raised with her, well, that's good. Still doesn't mean that a husband should proceed with it because, again, you're not going to ask your wife for, for permission. It's not like, once the wife eats it, it's, it's okay, then I, can, then I can do it. No, 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 no. Once you've tabled your idea with your wife and she doesn't see any issues with it and she seems happy for, you know, about progressing forward with it, well, then that husband still needs to go away and needs to think about it and he says, before the Lord, is this the right decision that I have to make for my family? So that's if your wife is supportive of the idea. What if the wife's feedback, what if the wife's counsel is not so supportive. What if the wife hears what the husband has to say but goes, I'm not a fan of the idea. (laughs) 
I, I, I don't really see it the way that you're seeing it. Well, it's not a wise at that point for a husband to take the attitude of, well, my way or the highway. You know, to be honest, and as far as I'm aware, I might have to ask my wife about this, <laughs> I've never said to my wife in the last 15 years of marriage, you know, when she doesn't quite, you know, on the same page with an idea that I've tabled, I don't think I've ever said to her, wifey, submit. Or words to that effect. I've never said, you must submit right now. No. It's not that sort of attitude of like, it's my way or the highway. Instead, it's wise to discuss the reasons with your wife as to why it is that she's, why is it that there are hesitations? What is causing you to hesitate? I know personally that when I table an idea with Claret, well, she often raises very good and very valid points, points that I'd, I'd never even considered and probably points that I wouldn't consider that I just kind of, you know, overlook at times. And so when I bring the idea to my wife, what it forces me to do as a husband, it forces me to go away and have a bit of a think about it. It forces me to just kind of run it through my mind a few more times. And so having thought about it, well, I then go and I bring the idea back to Claret, hopefully with some additional thoughts, not just rehearsing the same thing I said the first time and hoping I'm going to get a different response, but hopefully put a little bit of thought into it and saying, well, you know, maybe these are valid points and maybe I've thought a bit beyond this. Maybe there's a way that it could work based upon my wife's hesitations. However, if she's still not convinced, well, what this does for me is that it causes me to really slow down the decision-making process. And that should be the case for each and every husband. They should slow it right down when it comes to the fact when you've dialogued with your wife, where you've explained, you've talked through things, you've re-rationalised, you've, you've, you've had the conversation. You're still not seeing eye to eye. You really should slow things down. I may still go away and make the same decision that I feel is, is to be best, but I'm going to do so by exercising some serious caution as I do so. I won't be so confident in that necessarily because I'm thinking to myself, you know what? The person who knows me best, my second in command, she's not seen it the same way that I am. Someone still has to make the call here. And so I exercise some serious caution. In addition to this, when my wife is not supportive of an, of an idea, I want to try to establish, is it a firm no or is it a passive no? <laughs> Is this like a firm no, I I really feel strongly about this, or is it just like, no, I'm not too sure? A passive no is one of those times that my wife has an opinion or a preference on something, but she doesn't particularly feel strongly about that. In other words, it's not going to be a super big deal if things don't go her way. That's a passive no. So if my wife has not seen eye to eye, I'm I'm wanting to understand you. I'm going, "Is is it a firm no or is it a passive no? A firm no is obvious. It's one of those times where my wife does feel strongly about it. It will be a big deal for her if the decision goes contrary to what it is that she is thinking. You see, as a husband, I want to be very, very mindful that the decisions that I make, that they are going to affect my wife. And when I look to Scripture, it is very clear that I'm not meant to be exercising my leadership or my headship or my authority within marriage I should not be exercising it like a bulldozer. Okay? When I look at biblically how I should be exercising, it's not like a bulldozer. Yes, I may have to make some decisions where my wife does not always see see things eye to eye with myself. But even when that's the case, as a husband, I need to be very, very mindful of how that is done. Now let's talk about things from the wife's point of view. When your husband raises the idea with you that sounds good... Well, there's not really a whole lot, of, whole lot to discuss, is there? <laughs> not too much issue with that. Well, my husband has a bright idea. This is great. I'll go along with that. But what about when he raises an idea in which you have reservations about? Well, this is a time where, obviously, you express your thoughts. You express your reasons as to why it is that you don't agree with the idea. And remember, your objections at this point for wives, you have to remember, don't, it's, submission is not silent submission. Okay? You, remember, your objections at that point when your husband is tabling something with you, your, 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 your reasons for why you don't agree, your, your reasons for your objections, they can be very, very helpful for your husband for things that you may not have thought through yet. So I suppose we ask the question, we'll take the scenario even further now. 
What about when you've expressed, a wife's expressed her thoughts, but after thinking about it, the husband comes back to her and says that he's going to be proceeding, plans to proceed in the way that he first mentioned anyway. Well, at that point, for the wife, it really depends how strongly you feel about the decision. Under normal circumstances, this is simply a time where a wife needs to recognise the authority, recognise the leadership of her husband, and to submit to that leadership. That's ordinarily speaking. However, if your husband makes a decision that you feel strongly about, there, there is a place to ask your husband to reconsider. Some couples call this an appeal. <laughs> this, what this does is that it recognises, a, a wife recognises her, her husband's responsibility to, to make the final decision, but there's something that's already in place that's set up as a backdrop or a backstop. So that if there's anything extra that the wife needs to bring to the table, some extra considerations that may not have been tabled already, well, it just provides an opportunity for that to happen. It's very, very important that this is established. And whatever wording a couple wants to use, whether it's an appeal or whatever you want to kind of call it, you make it up yourself, talk about it with your spouse. Whatever it is, you need to make sure that you're both on the same page about that ahead of time. So that it doesn't come across that a husband talks with his wife, makes the decision, and then it sort of seems as though the wife now is just going to keep on battling and not acknowledging or not submitting to that decision. That's not what an appeal is. Appeal is just to say, hey, look, we've talked about it. You've made a decision that's going contrary to what I feel. But hey, there's a few extra things that I just feel like I need to kind of express or bring to the table just as part of this decision. I'm recognising that you've made the decision and I'm willing to to submit to that because that is my responsibility as a wife. But there's just a few extra things that I need to talk about. Now, this does not mean, okay, this does not mean that a wife sits her husband down and thinks he has the right to rehash the same points over and over again, hour after hour, until the husband is so worn down that he concedes just to end the torture that he's going through at that time. That is not what an appeal is. (laughs) Instead, the principle of an appeal is acting as a backstop, and so it's something that you and your spouse may like to talk about ahead of time to see, well, how is that going to look in your relationship when it comes to decision-making. But for the wife, when there are times when your husband makes a decision that goes against your wishes, it's important for a wife to recognise that by submitting to her husband, it doesn't mean that you are supporting the idea necessarily, but you are supporting the man who has been given the responsibility to make the decision. It's so important. For a wife to submit to her husband and something that she feels strongly against, and look, I just don't think this is the right course of action or this is not the right thing to do, by submitting to her husband is not saying that she agrees with the idea or supports the idea, but she is supporting the man who who has made the decision, who's been given the responsibility and the authority to make the decision. In other words, submitting to your husband's leadership, you're not saying that you agree with it, you're just saying, look, I am willing to honour God by recognising my husband's God-given authority to lead within my family. That's all it means. Now, of course, we have talked about the husband initiating his uh, ideas with with his ideas with his wife, but that's certainly not to say that wives don't communicate their ideas or initiate ideas to be put on the table or to be put on consideration with their husbands. Wives should... And they can bring their desires, they can bring their wishes to their husbands. And, of course, when they do so, they follow the same kind of process. There is discussion, there's consideration, there may be even appeal if need be. But at the end of the day, the wife is leaving the final call in the hands of her husband. A quick quote from a marriage counsellor and author by the name of Wayne Mack. And this is what he says. He says, submission means a wife sees, her, sees herself as part of her husband's team. She has ideas, opinions, desires, requests, insights, and she lovingly makes them known. But she knows that in any good team, someone has to make the final decision. She knows the team members must support the team leader 
his plans and decisions, or no progress will be made, and confusion and frustration will result. 50-50 marriages where the husband leads half the time and the wife leads the other half are an impossibility. They do not work. They cannot work. In marriage, someone has to be, has to be the, the final decision maker and God has ordained that this should be the husband. Now, I suppose it's worth mentioning that the extent of a husband being the final decision maker, the extent that he is a final decision maker, that's going to vary from marriage to marriage. In my marriage, I don't feel as though I need to be the one to make the final decision as to what kind of toothpaste we get. In my marriage, you know, I don't feel like I need to be the final decision maker as to what nappies we buy or which supermarket that we we shop from. I just don't feel throughout my marriage that that's something that I need to be all over the details with. You see, within a marriage, there can be what we can call delegated leadership or delegated responsibility. For example, in our family, I made the final call that we would home educate our children along with the support of my wife. I made the final call, though. It was a significant decision. It was a big picture decision, and it involved the direction that our family would be going in. But in terms of the day-to-day outworking of that decision and the day-to-day outworking of that responsibility, that's something in, in me exercising my leadership that I've, I've delegated to my wife, primarily. And so what this means is that Claret doesn't need to come to me to ask, hey, I've got one of the kids' tests here. Is it okay to mark it? She doesn't have to ask me that. She just gets on and she does the business. She just gets on with it. Once the direction is set, Once the responsibilities have been delegated, there is much room for a wife to function autonomously without her feeling as though she needs to go and bring each and every decision to be run past her husband. Again, the extent of delegated responsibility, that's going to vary. And it's not something we can go and say, this is the right way and this is the wrong way, or this is too much or this is too little. No, no, no. There's no, there's no, there's there's just going to be differences. And so the extent in which responsibilities are delegated, where the wife is sort of functioning in an autonomous kind of way, still under the banner of her husband's leadership and things that he has already talked about and decided upon, that's going to vary from couple to couple. And so it's really something that couples need to talk about and talk it through for themselves. Maybe some husbands feel like they've got to be all over the details. Other husbands can kind of set the course a little bit more, a bit more broader, and say to the wife, would you mind just taking care of, you know, the details, but this is the direction that we're heading in. It's going to vary from couple to couple. Well, this is probably a good time now to transition from the practice of submission to next, the test of submission. We've looked at a definition. We've looked at the need. We've looked at some practicalities, kind of some practical application. But next I want to talk about the the test of submission. You see, it's not going to be too difficult for a wife to submit to her husband's leadership if she agrees with all the decisions that he ever makes. I mean, how hard is that? (laughs) You know, I, I, I never disagree with any of my husband's decisions. We're always on the same page. And yes, I am a very, very submissive wife. I mean, how hard is it to submit to a husband if you agree with everything that he says? You see, submission is, is, is only really exercised, submission is only really put to the test when your husband makes a decision that you disagree with. That's when, at that very point, submission is exercised. That is where the rubber meets the road. That's when a wife gets to see exactly how submissive she actually is. At the end of the day, the true test of submission is when a wife disagrees with her husband. And so let's just spend a bit of time now to kind of talk about this. This is very important. You see, a husband can make submission easier, but a husband can never make submission easy. He can make it easier, but he can't make it easy. A husband can make submission easier when he has a consistent walk with God. It is very understandable that a wife is going to struggle with her husband's decisions 
if there is blatant sin within his life. It's understandable if that a wife is going to struggle with her husband's decisions when he is a man that does not pray. When he is a man that does not read the Bible. When he is a man that is not involved in the local church. A a wife will have very little confidence, and, and rightfully so, in her husband's ability to make the right decisions for the family if he is an unspiritual man. What a Christian wife truly desires is a man who is guided and directed by the Lord. When a wife knows that her husband is regularly in prayer, regularly in the word, she's going to have a lot more of an easier time placing trust, an easier time placing her life and also the life of her family into his hands. Now, although there are plenty of reasons for why a Christian husband should be reading the Bible and praying and being involved in the local church, one of those reasons is to make it easier on your wife to submit to your leadership. But again, even though a husband can make submission easier, he can never make it easy. So how about we put it into a wee bit of a question here. How is it possible for a wife to submit to her husband when she is confident that her husband is wrong. <laughs> I don't know if we can put it more blunt than that, can we? How is it possible for a Christian wife to submit to her husband when she is confident, when she is assured that her husband is wrong? Well, firstly, can I just say that husbands are going to sometimes be wrong. They're going to make wrong decisions, just like everyone. They're human. Maybe some more than others, but needless to say, husbands are going to sometimes make wrong decisions. For the husband, the difficulty, a lot of times, with the bad decisions that he makes, well, they're going to be really experienced after the fact. They're going to look back, the husband will look back in in hindsight and go, man, that was a dumb idea. Why did I do that? Why did I decide on that? And the wife feels like saying, I told you so, but she doesn't. She gives you the look that makes you think that you know she's thinking that, but she may may, may not say that. So the husband will realise after the fact, usually, that it's a dumb idea. But as for the wife, and especially the wife that can see ahead of time that her husband's decision in a particular area is not a good one, what is the best way for what is the best way for a wife to process that? What is the best way forward for a wife in that kind of situation, biblically speaking? Well, firstly, we have to quantify and qualify what it is that we mean when we talk about a bad decision. We are not talking about sin. We're not talking about Abuse, just like what it is that we talked about last week. But outside of the realm of abuse and sin, there are still going to be any number of unwise decisions that us husbands are just capable of making. So how should a wife deal with this? Well, the place to start with is Scripture. The Bible does not say, Wives, submit to your own husbands when you're confident that they're going to make the right decision. The Bible doesn't say that, does it? The Bible doesn't say, wives, submit to your own husbands when you are sure that he has just got a great idea and it's going to be really beneficial for your family. It doesn't say that. What this means is that apart from sin and abuse, a wife has a God-given duty to submit to her husband's leadership even when she knows that the husband's decision is a bad one. Now, there may be exceptions to this. I can only think of one. And that is where a husband may have been diagnosed as being mentally ill. He's not in his right mind. Let's go sell the house and with the proceeds just burn them in a bonfire and keep warm tonight. That kind of thing. That doesn't mean that every single time your husband makes a decision that you disagree with, you go, he's out of his mind. Doesn't mean that you say, he's crazy. That's why we're not doing it. Isn't it interesting? Every decision that I disagree with, he's mad. No. I'm not using it as an excuse for that. But if a husband has been diagnosed with mental illness, which would hinder him from making sound, rational decisions in that season of your marriage, then yes, there may be an exception in that circumstance for a wife to not submit to her husband. But apart from that exception, and apart from sin or abuse... A wife has a God-given duty to submit to the leadership of her husband 
even when she knows that her husband is going to make a bad decision. Now, I realize that this is a truth from Scripture, which is an incredibly difficult pill to swallow. So I'm not saying it by going, hey, well, this is it, and just ramming it home, and there you go. I'm not going to try to do the bulldozer on any wives here today and going to go, there it is. Praise God for that, right? Go in the direction that you know to be wrong. God wants you to. I mean, that's not the idea. That's not the heart behind it. I realize this is one of those truths, and it's an incredibly difficult truth to accept, especially for the wife who has been having to live through unwise decisions and unwise leadership from her husband. But can I just take a moment on this subject just to issue a somewhat of a sober warning? I want to issue a sober warning to each and every single woman. That includes the younger children here. If you're female, young ladies, older ones that are single that desire for marriage, I want to, I want to issue a very sober warning to each of you. So please listen to me. It is critical for you that you carefully choose the right man when it comes to marriage. It is imperative that that the man that you marry is a man that you have some kind of confidence in that he loves God and that he's willing to walk in the fear of God. I say this to my daughters often. I tell them that if they choose to marry a husband because he's funny... If he chooses, if they choose to marry a, a husband because he's popular, because he's rich. But if that man does not have a heart for God, if he does not walk in the fear of God, he is going to make decisions for their family that will not honor God. I tell my daughters often that if this was to happen, if they were to marry because of wealth, humor, popularity, but he's not a man of God. If this was to happen and they were to come to me suffering under that kind of leadership, the family is suffering because of what it is their husband is doing, I would have to look at them squarely in the eyes and say to them, my dear, God requires for you as a Christian woman to submit yourself under the leadership of that man. That is what God requires of you. Now, there are a few things that unsettle me. as much as that kind of thought. And so single ladies, please hear this. Please choose your husband carefully, knowing what it is that God requires of you as a Christian woman. But back to the wives here today. How is it possible? How is it possible for a wife to submit to her husband even when she is confident she knows that her husband is wrong? Well, wives... This is where you really need to weigh in on the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. By submitting to the leadership of your husband, what you are ultimately doing, wives, is that you are ultimately entrusting yourself into the well-being of of God's capable hands. Wives, what you are essentially saying is this. You're saying, Lord, although I know that my husband is about ready to make a bad decision... I know that two wrongs don't make a right. And so, Lord, as I submit to the leadership of my husband, as your word requires me to, I trust that you, God, are going to be the one that ultimately cares for myself and my family. And can I just say for wives that God is far more capable of being God in the life of your husband than actually what you are? He's far more capable of being God. God is far more capable of correcting your husband. God is far more capable of disciplining your husband if necessary. As a wife, you focus on honoring God through your submission to your husband, even when you know that a decision is to be a wrong decision. And wives, can I just say, you watch God sustain you and your family despite the decisions that your husband makes. And can I just say... It's also okay for wives to remind their husbands (laughs) that they are ultimately answerable to God in the way in which they exercise their leadership. It's okay for a wife to remind her husband the decision that you are about to make is 
is one that you have to stand before God. You're accountable to God as a leader of this family. Once Claret has expressed her thoughts on leading up to a decision, and, and if it's looking as though the decision is not going to be going the way that she would quite like it to go, well, oftentimes, with a humble attitude, and often with a little smile on her face, she says to me, well, Jason, I've said everything that I've needed to, and so I acknowledge that the final decision is now up to you. So whatever you decide is between you and God. And she kind of just leaves me there, standing there. And she gets on with the, the rest of the, the day, and she does so with a very pleasant attitude. A little skip in her step. As for me, I'm kind of left with this weighty burden, wondering to myself, man, am I actually making the right decision here? I've, I've taken counsel from my wife, and she's not seen it the same way that I am. Now it's between me and God. I mean, how to counter this stuff. It makes me pause and think about it. But interesting though, isn't it, wives? That it's not because the wife is there bickering and just nagging and criticizing and putting down and comparing her husband with others. But instead she says her bit, she makes sure she's heard, she appeals if necessary, and she reminds her husband, look, I'm freeing you up to make your decision. This is between you and the Lord. It's not going to affect our relationship together. Freeing it up. I am am in God's hands ultimately, and you, my friend, are answerable to God ultimately. It's a far better pressure, a far better weight for a husband to carry than the weight of a nagging wife. Well, moving on from the test of submission, we come finally now to the attitude of submission. We look at the definition, the need, the practice, the test, now the attitude. And can I just start by saying this? The way that we submit is just as important as submitting itself. When we first trained our children to obey our instruction, well, it was quite a sight. You may actually see it every once in a while with Asher, a two-year-old. We tell them to come to us, come to Daddy. And they would eventually obey the instruction, but they wouldn't do it joyfully. They would be coming to us and coming to Dad with tears, with loud, obnoxious sounds and noises. Yes, they did submit, but they didn't do it joyfully. One of the things that we sought to teach our children from a very young age is that unless it's joyful obedience, it's not obedience at all. It's like the school teacher that says to the student, take out your book, and he takes the book out and slams it down, on the, defiantly slams it down on the desk. When the parent asks their the, the, the child, hey, can you please come and help with the dishes? And they walk over to the sink, but they're rolling their eyes and they're sighing and they're scoffing. You see, a person submits with, if a person submits with a bad attitude, well, the question really has to be asked, are they actually submitting at all? While we can sometimes think of submission as an outward kind of action, submission really is something that we do inwardly. It's something which takes place within our heart. When it comes down to it, submission is an attitude of the heart. I once heard a story of a man who enlisted in the U.S. Army. The commanding officer asked the new recruits, saying, what should you do with every command that I give to you? One soldier said, well, make sure that we have heard and we know exactly what it is that you expect of us. Another soldier said, well, we learn from the command that is given. Another still said, well, we carry out the the request as soon as possible. The commander said, no, none of those those are the right responses, even though they may have merit in and of themselves. The commanding officer said to these new recruits, he went on to say, the right response is to take the order and to make it your own. In other words, once the command was given by the one who was in authority over them, they were to follow through with that with the kind of attitude as though they themselves had initiated it or with the attitude that they themselves wanted to do what it is that they were asked to do. If a soldier moaned, if he groaned, if he rolled his eyes, if he complained, if he argued with the commander after the commander gave him something to do, well, 
This would not be considered obedience. This would not be considered submission one, one little bit. And I mean, this applies right across the board. It applies with the student and teachers. It applies between children and parents, uh, employer, employees and employers. And so it is when it comes to the relationship of a wife submitting to her husband. A wife's attitude when she is submitting to her husband's leadership is just as important as the act itself. As mentioned earlier, submission is not always supporting the idea, but it is supporting the man whose leadership has decided upon the idea. One final thought to touch on here, and that is simply the necessity of wives placing their husbands in a position to lead. Final thought. The necessity for wives placing their husbands in a position to lead. What do I mean? Well, in a situation where a husband is is, is not leading, well, what is the temptation going to be? The temptation for the wife is always going to be, hey, I've got to take the reins. I've got to start making the decisions. I've got to try to fill the void some way. But wives, can I just say that this does not encourage your husband to lead? A husband will think to himself, great, (laughs) she's got it sorted. She's making the decisions. She's doing all the hard work. Well, I won't interfere with that. I'll just take a step back. But you see, it is possible for a wife to put her husband in a position to lead by not making the final decisions and instead deferring to her husband to be the one who makes the final call. Sure, a wife will perhaps help and do a lot of the prep work leading up to the point where her husband is to make a decision, but when it comes to actually making the decision itself, it's about a wife letting the husband know the final call is with you. Because what this does is that it forces or encourages a a, a husband to take upon himself the mantle of leadership. If a wife really wants her husband to lead, she needs to put him in a position to lead. If a wife really wants her husband to lead, she needs to encourage him. She needs to get behind him. She needs to allow for him to feel that weight of responsibility. And then when the husband does begin to lead, the wife needs to be, be, be careful that she is not complaining about the decisions that he makes. She's not to criticise him for not doing the things in the, way, the, the ways and the things that she wants things to be done. There are some husbands that are just really discouraged to take the lead because they know that their wives are just going to fight them on every single point and on every decision that they make. And so the husband reasons to himself and thinks to himself, well, hey, you know, what's the point in even trying to lead? I might as well just save myself the hassle and let her make all the calls. I'll have an easier life that way. While all the while the wife is saying, well, I just don't have a husband who leads. A wife needs to embrace the decisions that her husband makes and she needs to resist the temptation, especially if she has a strong personality. She has to resist the temptation of taking over. Sure, if the wife takes a step back and lets her husband take the lead, Things are expected to go poorly for a little while. You're going to miss deadlines. Things aren't going to happen the way that perhaps the wife may have done it. Things may not run efficiently at first. And so I don't want to give any kind of impression here to say that if you follow the biblical principles for marriage, that everything is just going to work out perfectly right from the very start. I mean, if a husband has never led before, has never been allowed to lead, never had a desire to lead, and he starts to lead within his family, well, he's probably not going to start leading by hitting the ground running. I mean, if the, if, the, if the husband has never been in the driving seat of his family, he's probably going to be swerving all over the road at first. That's just to be expected. But you see, a wife cannot be short-sighted when it comes to this. Instead, the wife has to have the, the long game in mind. She has to think to herself, what is going to be Best for my family, big picture wise, not just what am I going to have for dinner tonight? Where should we go out for dinner tonight? She has to think about it in a broader kind of way. One writer put it this way she said, This. She said, When a woman hands back the reins to her husband, 
She must let go completely. She must turn her back on it, come what it may. If he makes a mess of it, let him suffer the consequences. Refer all the questions to him. Don't shield him in any way. He must suffer. That is the only way that he will learn to lead. You see, if a wife communicates this reality to her husband through her actions, she can be confident that sooner or later, I don't know when, but sooner or later, her husband's going to wake up and realize and figure out and go, wow, she actually expects me to be in charge here. She's not going to take over. Things are not happening. I'm missing deadlines. Things are not going, the, going very smoothly. I better get my act together because whenever anyone asks what's going on with the family, she points to me and goes, there's the leader. <laughs> there he is. Now, it's important that a wife also learns to embrace the leadership style of her husband. So important. It's important that a wife learns to embrace the leadership style of her husband. Men have different personalities. They're going to approach things in a different kind of way. In other words, God has not created every single human being and every single husband with a a type A personality. He hasn't created every husband with that type A personality that is just very ambitious and and decisive and even aggressive in the decisions that he makes. And can I just say that's actually okay? Because that's the way that God has actually created that man. And by the way, that's the personality of the man that you chose to actually marry. There is nothing that will discourage a husband faster than a wife who continually compares his leadership style to the leadership style of other husbands who may have that type A personality, that that aggressive, decisive kind of, you know, extrovert kind of personality. Nothing will discourage a husband faster than if a wife is saying, why don't you be more like him? Again, a wife needs to learn to embrace the leadership style of her husband, encourage him in the things in which he's doing well. And when you see deficiencies in his leadership, which, by the way, there will be deficiencies, like there's deficiencies in my own leadership of my family, when there's deficiencies, you don't criticise or compare him But instead, you use the God-given gifts that God has given to you to be what it is that God has created you to be for your husband. You be his helpmate. You use the strengths that God has given to you to supplement, not to take over, not to override the husband's leadership, but to complement the needs and the weaknesses that he may have as he leads. He must still be the leader. Well, this brings us really to the end of our study this morning. We've looked at today what? We've looked at the, the practicalities of a wife's submission. We've looked at the definition. We've looked at the need. We've looked at the practice. We've looked at the test. And we've looked at the attitude. Now, I realise that, similar to last week, the nature of today's sermon is more to do with application. A big portion of my sermons are what? Theological, right? Right? That's why we do eight and nine part series on eschatology and, and predestination and things of that nature, right? That, that's generally our normal, you know, diet, spiritual diet is very theological. But similar to last week, today is more around application. Why? Simply because what the Bible says about this subject is very clear, it's very straightforward, and really where the real work is needed, It really comes down to how this principle is worked out practically within our marriages today. And so I do hope that today, similar to the other weeks, has been helpful. Helpful for couples to be able to to think through, how does the principle work out in my own marriage? Next week, uh, we'll have Chris Baines preaching, as mentioned. Week after that, we'll be picking up right where we've left off here. We'll be looking at the power of submission, and we'll also be looking at the the supplements of submission, which follows that as well. In the meantime, again, encourage married couples. Don't just leave it here, you know. Don't leave it with little nudges to your spouse, you know, or there's points being made over the pulpit. But go home, think about it, put the kids, kids to bed, Put them in front of a movie, do whatever you want. (laughs) Sit down, have a chat, talk about things, reflect, talk about how decision-making works in your family, talk about the struggles, talk about 
um, you know, appeals, talk about these, these kinds of things, because at the end of the day, it's not just, you know, hey, that sounded good over the pulpit. At the end of the day, we want marriages to be bolstered up and functioning in a biblical kind of way. And so I encourage married couples, go home, think about it, talk about it. Husbands, be very, allow much room for your wives to be transparent about your leadership and what make it, might make it a little bit easier for her. Wives, allow for your husbands to be very transparent with you as to how it is that they are receiving your submission to their leadership. And if there's anything that needs to be kind of tweaked in that regard as well. Engaged. I know at least one person's engaged here. Make sure that you're thinking this through, talking this through with your prospective spouse. And, and again, younger, younger ones, younger children, also the talk with your parents. Singles, talk amongst friends and talk about how it is that these kind of principles are to be worked out in marriage. I'm going to finish there. With the, I'm going to pray. And then uh, Joe is going to be coming up and leading us in the Lord's Supper today. So let's just pray. Father, thank you for the word. Thank you that we can be talking about these things. Thank you that your word is clear. It's concise. Um, but the application of it can sometimes take a little bit of work. And I do ask that although today has been very, very heavy on application, um, I, I, I pray that to the degree in which it's been, it'll be helpful for couples to think through how it's going to work out in their own marriages I ask that that would happen, Lord. Help there to be good conversations that take place, conversations that are helpful and glorifying to you. For the sake of our marriage, as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.